This is really about being free to create what you want your life to look like. We each are our own hero. And how do we take the challenges that come our way and see those as the birth process of us becoming heroic? Can you meet that judgment that ultimately will surface with neutrality? This is the Wall Street Coach Podcast with Kim Ann Curtin. Aloha, everybody. I'm so glad that you're all joining us for this conversation about William O'Neill and his trading genius, as well as his legacy. I'm Kim Ann Curtin, the Wall Street Coach. I have the only trading Discord room dedicated to mindset called TraderHeroJourney.com, and I host the Wall Street Coach podcast and got a select group of traders and investors on how to secure success with less pain. I have such distinguished people here today who have been influenced and taught and educated by William O'Neill's legacy. And I'm really honored that so many of them are here with me. We have Brian Shannon and Kathy Donnelly, Charles Harris and Eve Bobak, and Shane Doreen is going to join us. Uh, he's actually coaching in El Salvador, the U.S. surf team, Olympic U.S. surf team. So he, but Bill O'Neill's had such a big impact on him too. He's like trying to find a window to come into this conversation. And Joe, I'd love you to be, you know, share your thoughts too, if you want to. And Shane is here too. So I'm really glad. Um, Shane, I, you know what? I think I'm going to start with you because you really are the one who introduced me to Bill O'Neill in the first place. And that was thanks to a great conversation we had where you reached out to me to have Kathy Donnelly come on my podcast. You recommended the Life Cycle Trade by her and by Eve Buck. And I loved the book and then had. Kathy, come on my podcast, all because of you, Shane. So I'd love you to speak, especially because I know you have limited time, just about how you became a cancel trader and just the impact Bill had on you and your journey, if you're willing to share. Hey, Kim, can you guys hear me now? Yep, we sure can. Okay, cool. I just hopped on the call. I think I heard that you wanted me to speak first. Is that correct? I did, correct. Because you're the one who introduced me to Bill O'Neill in the first place via Kathy <sighs> and Eve's book, The Life Cycle Trade. So I thought, why not go right there? Because you're the one who turned me on to him in the beginning. Okay, cool. Well, first of all, I'm incredibly honored to be on this Twitter space with you guys. I'm a huge fan of everybody on here. I'm very familiar with Charles and Brian and Eve and Kathy and Joe and all of you guys. So I'm really happy to be part of this. I think I echo a lot of you guys with just the significant impact that Bill had on my life. You know, just a quick history. In 2005, I started going to the IBD seminars and the workshops. And I went to my level one and level two and level three. And then I did my master's. And, at you know, I actually got to meet Bill and Charles Harris was one of my presenters. And so I have a lot of history with IBD and with Bill O'Neill, and his work definitely changed my life, gave me a love for investing and trading. And yeah, I just think it's just incredible. Just I'm so inspired still to this day. It's been nearly 20 years, and you know, every day his work, you know, just provides a lot of inspiration. And I'm constantly reading Bill's books, and I wrote the Life Cycle Trade. I, I I read the Life Cycle Trade. And um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what to say, but I'm really happy to hear what you guys have to say. And I'm, I'm, in, I'm incredibly grateful to Bill and everybody at IBD and all the work that you guys have put in. Thank you so much, Shane. Kathy, I'm going to ask you to just chime in because you were also one of the first people I got to learn about how you're you felt so impacted by his work and how it began because of you joining an IBD group, if I'm remembering our conversation from way back when correctly. Hi, everybody, and thank you for inviting me, um, Kim and, and Shane also, for <laughs> getting me connected with Kim in the first place. I'm really happy to be here. It's such a great community that, that Bill and Neil created and, you know, I've been reading all these things about his legacy, and I just want to also highlight something that I haven't really heard come up, but I mean, it was his genius to create 
meetups so that people could learn his system together and create groups and learn about companies and have someone to, you know, talk to and, and learn together. And without that, you know, we wouldn't be here, I don't think, without the meetups, at least not me, because as Kim said, I, I did purchase his book. And I immediately learned that he had a meetup. And as soon as I found that out, there was luckily one by my house. And I jumped in and read the book and joined the meetup at the same time. And if not for that, I, my learning curve definitely would not have gone as, as a high as rate as it did. I actually started in 2006. Jane, Jane said 2005. So I started about a year later, joined the meetup, went to the last level three that William O'Neill did in Chicago, Illinois. And what I want to say about that is that course taught me everything I needed to know. And I probably wouldn't have even needed to go to any other class because when I re-listened to it, I'm just like, oh, he told me that. He told me that. But <laughs> there's just so much information, you know, it just takes so long to absorb. And I went to over 10 level fours and master's summits with Bill after that, after all those years. And, you know, Eve and I used to joke we were like his groupies because <laughs> we would go to any event that he was at. But anyway, I want to just share one last thing and then I can't wait to hear from the others. But one of my favorite quotes from him was from that level three. And I mean, I wrote it down in my notes and I was going to share with everyone. And one thing he said is, you know, how do we get something down, you know, in relation to learning about how to trade stocks? We have to repeat, repeat, practice, rehearse over and over until you have it backwards and forwards. And I think that's so true. And he built a community for us to do that. And I'm just forever grateful. Thank you. Kathy, I just remember you speaking about just the energy at the meetup. Would you just talk a little bit about that? And if it's still happening, how they take place for those who perhaps are not familiar with them, that I think would be a great thing to just talk about if you're open to it. Yeah, well, meetup.com. I think most people probably know what that is. And then, you know, I haven't joined one in so long. <laughs> so, but I assume you can still go to the Investors Business Daily website to get the list of all the IBD meetups that are available. I mean, there's some great ones now that are online that many people can join from, you know, you don't have, it's not local anymore. It's not your local library anymore. I mean, it can be, and I'm sure there still are some, but most people are online now. But yeah, it's just, it's great because everyone is there to learn and people will welcome the questions. And that's how, you know, we make sure we stay true to the basics of the system as well, because it's so easy to want to jump here and to jump there. And I think the IBD meetups really keep you grounded to the core principles that Bill taught. Thank you so much, Kathy, for sharing that. Eve, I'm going to ask you to just share. I, you and I have, we have crossed so many times with our DM. So first of all, Eve, it's just nice to have you here and to get to hear your voice now. Please just share also just the impact he had on you when it began for you. Just your little bit of your story of him and the influence he's had, if you're willing to. Thanks so much for inviting me, Kim. And hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to join everyone here today. This is a great space, and I'm honored to be participating. I really want to honor Bill. He has been, he was my mentor for so many years and has taught me so much. I read his book. I had a chance to meet him back in 1995, and he's taught me so much. But he's, one thing I wanted to mention is that he really was a great teacher and just loved to teach and share information and share his experience and knowledge. And the vision that I always have, like Kathy mentioned, we would go to his seminars every year and sometimes even more frequently. And he would always stay until lights out, you know, so a lot of times these would be held in hotels and the hotel folks would be cleaning up for the next event or to close down and they'd actually be flickering the lights and he'd still be answering people's questions. He just wanted to make sure that everyone's question was answered. So he's had a profound impact on me over the years. I go back over and reread his book and reread my notes from the seminars over the years. 
And you can probably see the influence as well in, in our book, The Life Cycle Trade, because we focus on find the, the very best companies, the exceptional companies. And one of the things, I've told a lot of stories over the last few weeks about Bill, but I don't think I ever told this story. This is just how he always honed in on a leader. Bill was always able to have the growth stock leader. Whenever you asked him the top name, he had it in his portfolio. And I often wonder, like, how is that possible? But one time we were at lunch during a seminar there was like a round table and a group of us that were attending and we were all talking with Bill and everyone was like throwing out different names of like tickers, you know, what do you think of this stock, Bill? What do you think of this stock? And he kind of like wasn't answering anyone. He was kind of waiting. And then he just finally said, you know, why when there's Facebook? And this was in 2013. And, you know, the takeaway there was he was always keenly focused on the leading stock, making sure he had that. So I just wanted to share that story. And one of my favorite quotes was what he wrote in my, and I asked him to sign his book when I first met him and I was a newer trader. And he said, I asked him to give me, you know, his advice. And in one sentence, it says it all. He wrote, buy the best companies with great earnings coming out of bases. So I always remember that and his positivity. He's always a very positive person and, you know, never giving up and always encouraging everyone to succeed. Wow. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I was part of what prompted me even thinking about doing this space was because Shane had sent me the IBD video on YouTube where there was a collection of, you know, I think it was a mostly men talking about just how, he had changed their life and every speaker in that video could barely get through their memories of Bill because they were so choked up and, and, you know, so emotional. And so you could feel how personally they felt devastated and lost of this man that they not only respected, but I want to say loved and they felt he loved them that just really knocked me out. And as I started to reflect on, you know, first you, Shane, to be honest, and then you, Eve, and Kathy, and Charles, like all the people that I have met, you too, Brian, like the quality of human beings that this man seemed to surround himself with, you know, made me sit up and take notice and think, wow. And one of the things I heard in Jim Ropel's comments in that IBD video, which I have to recommend to everybody, if you haven't watched it, you must, because it just is so powerful. He said, you know, money really wasn't his motive. I mean, obviously he did quite well, but that he was so motivated by building and lifting other people up, which I have to say with all of you people that are here, Brian, Eve, Kathy, Charles, Shane, and you too, Joe, like you guys are practicing that. So it's just, it's an impressive legacy to know that man lived that way and seems to attract people like that. So Brian, what are your thoughts on what I just said? Hey, Kim. Yeah. Thanks for having me. You know, I read that Bill's book, how to make money in stocks has sold somewhere north of a million copies. And I'm sure that those copies have been shared. And unfortunately, as a few of you here who are authors know, photocopied, uploaded, and all kinds of things. But the number of people that he left an impact on is just amazing. And, you know, he taught us how to think about the market and to be curious about what to look for and, you know, looking at different aspects and what's important and, you know, marrying fundamentals and technicals together was really groundbreaking. My first experience with the IBD, I think was in 1990. And I remember, you know, I was really, the first time I saw one of the daily graphs chart books, it was in 1991. It was uh, left out at a money manager's office for them to pick up a Monday morning And I saw it there like four Monday mornings in a row, and I would sit there and thumb through it because I would get in early. And one day I I had the balls or whatever, the probably not the balls, but I stole it. I brought it home, and I couldn't believe how much information was in those books and really just opened my eyes. So I I remember just going every Sunday to go pick them up because I couldn't wait for a delivery. 
But, you know, the number of people he impacted and his legacy will be left for a long, long, long time. It's just amazing. And I learned a tremendous amount from him. And I like to say that, you know, Bill kind of wrote the Constitution with that book in his newspaper and they will live on. And our job is to take the pieces of it to find what works for us personally make it our own and uh you know make our own amendments and adjustments to do the best we can in the market with you know some of his guiding principles and brian this might be you know my ignorance but i'm just kind of curious do you yourself self-identify as a can slim trader Earlier, you know, when I was a retail stockbroker, I did because it was more fundamentally driven and that I would always have to have a good story to back up a stock to sell to customers. I'm more technical than that now. So I I like to know and I still, you know, have a subscription to MarketSmith. I like to know the fundamentals, but I kind of view them. I don't want to get into, you know, me so much, but what I learned from Bill is, you know, when you marry them, and what's really important is what are other people interested in? If I know that there's other people interested in the fundamentals and that they're interested in, you know, a great chart, that's, you know, I never take the fundamentals literal. I don't take the technicals literal. I look at them and say, other people are looking at this and determining it's important. So I need to be aware in this area and take action. So that was the long answer to I don't anymore, but I used to. Yeah, it's great, though, Brian, because I'm positive there are people in this room who have different ways of taking his wisdom into what they currently trade. So I, my hope is that not only those who are very familiar with him, but those that aren't get to see the impact he's had, even on traders that maybe now self-identify differently. So oh, that was awesome. I'm so glad you shared that. Charles, I'm forever gonna- grateful to what he shared. Uh, it's so good. It's so good. Charles, I'm going to ask you to come in. And if you're willing, I would love for you to just perhaps encapsulate for those who maybe don't really know him, don't really know the canceling. I'm sure the majority of the people here do, but I'm sure there are some that don't. Is that something you're willing to do, Charles? And it's so of good course. to have you here. Yeah, Kim, thanks for having me. Thanks for putting this together. I think it's really terrific. And hello to all my, everyone out there and all the co-speakers are really, um, I've met all you guys really through the workshops and through my association with Bill, and which is really nice that in a way he brought all of us together. What, what do you want me to address exactly, Kim? You know, for those who perhaps are not as well versed in Bill and his kind of legacy and genius, like Cher, what Cam Slim actually, the style of it is, I mean, I know that's hard ask to simplify it, but just for those who perhaps are not as it, it really clear on what Cam Slim is, maybe just a basic explanation of that. So Cam Slim is an acronym for seven characteristics of some of the biggest winners in the history of the stock market. And Bill was very practical. He didn't look at the market and didn't study the market as an academic would. He basically was very practical. And one thing I would say about Bill, kind of this is a reflection of the way he looked at the market is, obviously he was you know incredibly intelligent, highly gifted in many ways, but he also just had basic common sense. And I think it, lots of times basic common sense will take you a lot further than kind of sheer brilliance. He had both. What Bill did was when he was a stockbroker back in the 1960s, he decided to look at the greatest winning stocks in the prior, I don't know, 10 or 15 years and kind of boiled down that these leaders have anything in common that he can kind of look for future winners. And he kind of came up with this acronym CANSLIM for what those seven characteristics were. And so obviously he did find similarities between these great winners. So each letter of can slim represents one of these characteristics. So the C would be current earnings. So very much can slim is very much a growth stock kind of investors way of looking at things. He's not looking for deep value or things that just seem cheap. He's looking for high growth companies that 
are kind of kind of paving new ground and really changing the world with regard to innovation and showing leadership in those types of ways. So the C would be current earnings. And so, and basically for each of these, you know, letters that, that represent Canslim, he's looking for a certain kind of a certain baseline. So if you read the book, which I recommend everyone read his book, How to Make Money in Stocks, he would be looking for a minimum of, let's say, 25% earnings growth. But the great leaders, you know, if you look in, you know, over the biggest winners over the last hundred years had much more explosive earnings and sales and profit margins and so forth. So anyway, the C is for current earnings. He wants to see a history of the last several quarters of strong earnings growth. A would represent annual earnings. So basically, when these great leaders started their moves, the fundamentals were already very strong. And a lot of people associate kind of Bill's methodology with a very technical approach to the market. But if you really kind of analyze it, Bill would say that it's really more, say, 80% fundamental, only 20% technical. And so Bill would never buy, typically never buy a stock just based on the chart pattern. It had to have these fundamentals and kind of have to have the story for a couple of reasons. One, that is, you know, what, you know, the basis of a big stocks move is typically going to be for fundamental reasons. And two, how are you going to manage a position properly if you don't really believe in the company, if you don't really believe they have something special going on? So for both those reasons, it's really important that the stock have the, these fundamentals. So we have got C for current earnings, A for annual earnings. The N in can slim is for something new. And to me, this is the, if you're going to say what is the most important factor, I think the N in can slim is kind of the essence. We're looking for something new in terms of a new product, a new service, maybe a new CEO, maybe a new brand new market that's never been, you know, brand new, like AI today would be something like that. The internet, when the internet revolution started, that would be, you know, new. The advent of the PC was new. The advent of the car, the automobile, these, you know, these are, you know, getting on early into a, a brand new innovation can be incredibly profitable. So to me, the end is very important. And when Bill would kind of research a stock, he would say that it's really, if you should be able to boil down kind of why this company is special in like two sentences and a kid should be able to understand it. You don't need pages and pages to figure out what this, what the company does, what are they doing in one or two sentences that's making a huge difference. So in, in Part of Bill's genius was he really was able to hone in on the leader just in a way based on, you know, what are they doing and how are they different and why do they have an advantage that other people don't, other companies don't. So that's the, um, the C-A-N, the can, the, um, we got the S, can so far. S, yep, we're at S-L-I-N. We're at S. So S, is, S is, stands for supply and demand. When Bill started trading back in the 60s and kind of came up with this acronym, he was really looking for newer companies, smaller companies, companies that had gone public maybe more recently because stocks that have a smaller float are easier to move. So if you know a stock has only 50 million shares outstanding, it doesn't take nearly as much buying pressure to move the stock as opposed to a stock that's been around for a long time and has 5 billion shares outstanding, it's going to be harder to kind of propel that stock. He kind of relaxed that over the years when, you know, the markets has become larger and larger, more and more active. And there's, you know, institutions have really dominate the market. And there's so many now mutual funds, ETFs, you know, there's just so much institutional involvement that they really need liquid names in order to create a portfolio. So the supply and demand in terms of the float really isn't as important as it was back, you know, 40 or 50 years ago. 
but you still want to see demand and big volume come in at important points on a chart. Even if there's billions of shares outstanding, if, you know, Microsoft or Google or Tesla, you know, very active stocks and very liquid stocks, you still want to see the volume come in at those appropriate points. And then L is leader versus laggard. So we're really looking for the best name in the space in terms of earnings, sales, profitability, kind of market dominance, leadership in terms of the CEO. So that's what the L is. I stands for institutional sponsorship, which basically Bill didn't have to, Bill, his thing wasn't finding a new company that no one's ever heard of before. He was very happy to look at what the best institutions hold you know, the best money managers hold and just follow them. Because if a big institution, a quality institution is buying a stock and adding to a position, that is the really the fuel to propel the stock. And, you know, the market is very competitive. So if one big institution owns something that's working, you'll find that other institutions are going to come in as well just to keep up. So, you know, he wasn't really into being the first to own something. He just wanted there to be some institutional support for the stock, knowing that's what's really going to propel the stock up for months and months, maybe years. And then the M, the last factor is, what is the general market doing? M stands for market. And that is also this incredibly important because if you're not in a good market environment, all those other characteristics are not going to help the stock. In a bear market, most stocks are going to go down and will not be able to buck the, you know, the overall pressure of the market. So, and that's why I think CanSlim is such a rich methodology is because it takes into account the general market, it takes into account the fundamentals, and then, of course, it takes into account the technicals, which we haven't spoken about yet, but you know, those who are familiar with, you know, IBD and with Bill and with the approach know that, you know, there's a number of patterns we look for and we wait for that stock to move kind of through a point of resistance and we call the pivot point before we begin these, you know, before we take a position. And what he found in this study of the greatest winners, and we have a, a number of these studies, we call them model books. So you know, I've been involved, you know, being at the firm for, you know, nearly 25 years, I guess over 25 years, being involved in a number of model books. And basically each decade we take the biggest winners and we, we kind of populate, you know, what, how do these companies uh, rate on all these things we just talked about. And the thing is that all these companies – when they begin their great moves, they come out of what we call base patterns or kind of constructive consolidations that kind of serve as a basis for a move higher. So anyway, the strength of the methodology is that it takes into account the market, the fundamentals, and the technicals. And I really don't know of any other approaches that really take into account everything. You, usually you might have just a technical trader that's just looking at the chart, you might have a fundamentalist who has, knows nothing about technical analysis and this is basing it on earnings. And then very few people really know how to evaluate the general market and include that into the, you know, the whole formula. So it's just comprehensive and that's why it's worked so well, you know, decade after decade. Oh, Charles, thank you so much. And I just want to give a shout out to Charles's talk, A Trader's Journey. It was from an IBD talk that he did in 2019 in Santa Monica. One of the most authentic, honest, harrowing, you know, stories about his own personal journey. And I just was moved to tears watching it. And as an executive coach for traders, I was shocked to this day, Charles, at how honest you are at sharing the pain that you have journeyed through, which every trader goes through, but not every trader has the guts to say it out loud to benefit other traders. So please listen to that talk, everyone. And if you're enjoying this conversation with all these amazing people, please do a retweet to get more people here to hear them and their wisdom. I'm going to take this request that we have from HW. But John, if you hear me, John Boyk, I keep sending you an invite to join us to speak. But for whatever 
reason it doesn't seem to get picked up by you. So I just want, you know, I'm trying to give you speaker microphone too. So HW, I'm going to let you speak. Please let us know what your question is for any of these speakers. Glad to have you here. Okay. All right. Well, I didn't know William and Neil personally, but I've been a, a broker for over 30 years now. And I just remember the first time I was at Lehman Brothers way, way back. And then I had transferred to Bear Stearns in Dallas. I was with Lehman Brothers in Los Angeles. And anyway, the guy I sat behind at Bear Stearns, he would pick stocks that would double and triple. And I was a pretty good broker. You know, I'd make a few points here. And I was a typical broker back then. And But the guy that sat in front of me, he would buy stocks that would double and triple. And not not fluky things, but on a kind of a regular uh, I got uh, anyway, he would buy stocks that would go up at, like double and triple on a regular basis. And I finally asked him one day, I said, hey, how do you do that? And I'd been a broker for, I don't know, five, six years. And he asked me a question and um, he goes, how long have you been a broker? I said, five years, six years. He goes, have you ever read a book on picking stocks? I was like, no. <laughs> I mean, you know, hey, that's what I do for a living. I mean, you know, I should write a book, I thought. Anyway, he says, he said some things and he goes, here's what I'm going to do. He gave me the book, how to make money. How to... And anyway, he says, read the book. He says, I'm not going to teach you how to do this. But if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. So I read the book and an, an epiphany kind of went off in my head. And it was like, look, if you'd have taken the biggest winners on Wall Street and overlaid their charts, one on top of, and I'm talking back then it was, you know, it was Home Depot and Walmart and Qualcomm and Amgen and whatever. He says, if you, if you, the book showed, if you'd have taken your, the charts and overlaid them one on top of each other, you would not know which one was which. And I thought, okay, well, so then the epiphany goes off and says, well, then if that's the case, and these were the biggest winners on Wall Street, then what I got to do is learn how to find these charts, what these patterns look like before they made their big moves. And that's the kind of the epiphany. And then once I figured that out, we, he and I became partners because we, you know, looked for the same things. And then we went together with a chart book and I was in Dallas, Texas. It was me, a guy named Steve Pickett, who's now, I think, at First Boston, and then my partner, who's now retired, and I'm retired. And then another guy by the name of Mark Cuban, that we all went together and bought the chart books that came out once a month. Uh -huh. and Beautiful. H.W., thank you so much for sharing that with us, because it's, I think this is what's so amazing about this whole, you know, the legacy and the ripple effect that this one man has had on so many people. So I am trying to get John Boyk to bring you in and Mike as well. Sintolo, I keep sending you guys invites to speak, but you have to accept it to be able to come in. So I hope you will if you're able to. Brian, I just wanted to come back to you. One of the things that I'm just curious about is it does seem to be, in my experience, a bit of a niche, the people that do can slim. I'm just curious, just your years in the market, what is it that you feel, what would be the questions one a trader might ask themselves to determine, is that a potential strategy that's right for them? It does sound as though it's a little bit more of a longer term approach. So I'm just curious, are there qualities that perhaps traders would want to ask themselves to consider this style. It all depends on time frame. And, and that's why I like to say, as I you know, repeated earlier, is that I think Bill wrote the Constitution and it's up to us to you know, figure out our style, but with a lot of his principles guiding it. And you know, his style was longer term than what I'm comfortable holding stocks. Even when I know all the you know, things, as Charles was saying, that you know, how can you hold a stock unless you have the confidence because you know what they do? Even when I know what they do, I don't have the stomach for, you know, some of the strong pullbacks in that. So my personality is simply shorter term, tighter risk management, 
and it doesn't allow me to hold the stocks as long. But it's the foundation. It's the Constitution. And I think that everyone should start with his book because it combines the fundamentals, which ultimately rule the market, and the technicals. So I think it'd be foolish for anyone to ever put a dime in the market without looking at that book first. So great. And I also just want to give a shout out to Brian. His most recent book that came out in January is called Maximum Trading Gains with Anchored VWAP, the perfect combination of price, time, and volume. If you don't have this book, you should buy it because it's an amazing book. So it's Brian's first one. But this is the one that right now you probably want to get. John Boyk, I'm so glad we got you in the room. Thank you, Eve, for making that happen. Please just share some of your thoughts about Bill and what you think this you know, group that is here right now would probably love to learn about him and about your journey with him. Yeah, thanks for having me. I kind of screwed up getting in here, but... <laughs> Oh, good. You're, and you're I, please, I apologize. I have like the worst head cold and cough in the world right now. So I'll try to get. Sorry uh, to hear that. Try to, you sound great. You sound, sound great. as good as I can. Anyway, I just want to say, you know, condolences and thoughts and prayers to O'Neill's family and everybody and anybody who worked with him or for him. He was just a tremendous man, a great success. I can't think of anybody who had more of an impact on traders and investors than he did. And he's so humble, almost too humble, I think. <laughs> so he was just a giving person. I was a nobody and I, yeah, he got me published. I owe him a tremendous amount of gratitude. He started this whole crazy run for me. So <laughs> That's amazing, John. What was he like in person? How did you first meet him? What was the well, the dynamic, like you know, I don't want to, I don't want to bore everybody here with this story, but I'll do it in the short form. I was just trying to turn myself around, and somebody left an IBD newspaper on an airplane in the late '90s. I didn't even know what it was, and I was just trading off of CNBC, which was a nightmare, as everybody knows. And so I just went on this <laughs> massive research kick and found out about who he was and bought his book. And then I'm just a research junkie. So I wanted to go back and see how far this went. He had some heroes, some mentors that he learned from, Dreyfus and Livermore and Loeb and all that. So I went and read all those books. And then I just decided, I said, I kept going back to all those books, pulling out a page here or looking this thing up. And I said, how come nobody's put one together that has all the best from all these traders? So, yeah, my wife at the time said, what? You don't know how to write a book. <laughs> I said, well, I'm going to give it a try. So I put a book together. I went to Kinko's and got some crappy looking paperback put together. And I went out to L.A. to an advanced session where O'Neill was given the session in advanced what was it? How to Master Charts. That's where I got that great book from. And I put a letter in there and I went out, flew out there and IBD people at the desk were saying, what do you got there? And I said, I have this little book. I want to give it to William O'Neill. And they said, well, give it to us. We'll give it to him. And I said, no, I didn't. I didn't fly all halfway across the country to do that. I want to give it to him. I want to give it to him personally. And they said, well, good luck to him. And I mean, this was in 2001 or two up, up in there. So he had a little bit of security, not much, but definitely had some security with him. It was at the ho was at this hotel, was probably five or six hundred people there. And so I just kind of during the first break, he went around the backstage and I just went running down the side, <laughs> stalking the stalking the goat and popped a rope behind the stage and I was looking for him. I couldn't find him. He was actually in the restroom. He came out and he said, hi. And I said, hi, how are you? And I said, I gave him the book and he looked at the cover. It had his name, of course, and the other guy's names on it. He said, wow, this is kind of interesting. And I said, well, if you could, you know, find five minutes of your life, could you just please look at it and is, tell me if it's good or bad? Should I throw it away? And I had a letter in there. And by that time, the securities were coming by and, you know, you get out of here. You know, what are you doing back here anyway? So <laughs> I went back to the session and at the end of the session, I saw him leave and he still had the book in his hand. So I said, 
oh, well, at least he didn't burn it at lunch, you know, so maybe I got a shot. So <laughs> it was interesting because a month to the day after that, McGraw-Hill called my house and said, you wow. John Boykin? I said, yeah. And they said, well, who are you? And I said, I'm a nobody. <laughs> and they said, yeah, we know that. But <laughs> oh, Bill O'Neill sent this book to us and he wants to pub- he wants us to publish it. And whatever he wants, he gets. And I said, oh, excellent. Wow. And it worked. So wow. after that, it was going back and forth with him. I worked a lot with Kathy Sherman. I think she was the greatest person on earth. She was just, she was his personal assistant. And I used to call her an angel on earth. She was just incredible. And yeah. he would mark up the chapter I wrote about him with edits. He gave me suggestions. And I post, posted this on Twitter the other day. He wrote off to the side one time. He said, please excuse some of the liberties I'm taking. I'm like, what? You can't be kidding me. <laughs> I mean, he was just that humble. So he pushed oh, it God. through. He pushed he it through crazy. when the book came out. He, he had Harlan Ratsky, who's a great guy over there, contact me and said, Bill wants to put your book on the IBD website. And he said, let me tell you something, John. He's never endorsed another product that he hasn't produced himself. So wow. I, you know, I was grateful for that. The book did really well. Barron's picked it as one of the best books of the year. He con- he congratulated me for that. And then I had another idea, and I was doing the second book. And I sent that to him, and he, I put some of these things out on Twitter so everybody can see. He just Great. he did these handwritten notes to me that were, I was just like, he's taking time out of his day for me. Like I said, I'm Mr. Nobody, and... You know, I didn't create anything. I'm just taking pieces from everything else. I wanted to put it in a concise package so everybody could have like the cliff notes of the best books ever to, it, together in one package. And that's kind of why I did it. And he was extremely supportive of it, taking time out of his day for me. And it was just incredible. He's a great guy. And when Successful Investor came out, he sent me one of the first copies. I just got a FedEx package on my doorstep and he was probably the best gift he sent me a book out of his personal library about how to write better (laughs) so i kind of took that as well okay (laughs) so anyway i don't want to take up everybody's time there's some bigger names out there that work directly with him i'd like to hear their stories but anyway in summary what a great man a generous man a humble man and a huge loss the torch he left behind is going to be, have to be picked up by thousands of people, not just one or two. So, huge shoes to fill. John, I'm so glad you shared this story. And just the greatest guy. It's so beautiful to have that vignette of just a moment of how open minded he was and welcoming and, like you said, humble. But, John, he also was a very smart man so you didn't put something in front of him that he would have approved or moved forward with that publisher unless he saw your gifts so i don't think he suffered fools easily from everything i'm learning about him just in a very short amount of time so i have no doubt your books must pack a wallop so i'm looking forward to reading them be sure to follow john on here his twitter profile does have all of the books that he's written listed there. So please check them out. John, I'm so glad that you were part of this. We have Michael, who's been here for a while, requesting to ask or speak or share some thoughts. Michael, I'm going to unmute your mic now, or you can unmute your own mic. And hopefully I have given you permission to speak. Thanks for listening to this space, Michael. Thanks so much for having me on. So... I never met Bill, but he touched my life and he changed my life. I was trading for about 10 years and it was an absolute nightmare. And at the 10 year mark, that's when a coworker of mine introduced me to how to make money in stocks. And that, like so many other people, that was the book that really made a whole lot of sense. And earlier you would ask, why is Canslim great? Well, one of the reasons why I feel that Canslim is great is because I was able to 
understand and use that system while working a full-time job and doing the work at night and on weekends, setting up orders, and then being able to st step away and let them work. When I discovered how to make money in stocks, I treated that like it was a textbook. I read it a dozen times. And one of the great things about Bill, uh, I, I had just well, it was thinking about all this, you know, it would be an incredible achievement for somebody to have the level of success in the market that he did. But that's not all that he did. It would be incredible for somebody to create a newspaper uh, to help millions and millions of people and to rival the Wall Street Journal. And that's not all that, that he did either. It would be another thing to set up the, this whole system of canceling and identifying all this and creating courses and programs for it. And he did more than that, too. He set up this whole meetup program. And that's where things really started to really take off for me. Uh, the book was fantastic. When I started to learn about IBD and then I started to learn about the meetup programs, thankfully there was one nearby. I was in New York City at the time and I found that group and everybody that was there well, was so helpful. A and everybody was trading the can slim, uh, obviously. And the thing that I was able to learn from those groups was that, and it actually is something that I remember reading in How to Make Money in Stocks. And I think that it's one of the things that isn't talked about as frequently, but there, there was a portion in that book that I remember where Bill had mentioned that it's not his system, it's the market system. I took that to- oh, beautiful. I took that to be that the market was speaking to him through through his studies, what he was modeling, through what he was observing. And there was also another story in there about learning about fish. If you want to learn about fish, go to an aquarium and then watch fish. It, Beautiful. That, Beautiful. Mike, I, Mike, I'm going to cut you off there just because I want to give Charles an opportunity to answer a couple of questions I got from the audience. But I'm just I just love your enthusiasm and how like I can feel everybody who talks here is just so passionate about what this man did for him. It's just absolutely it's just inspiring to think he had this much of an impact. Charles, I have a couple of questions I wanted to ask you. One of the gentlemen who's listening to us in the room, Shane Kapotamus, said that he's really curious about whether Bill O'Neill's methodologies have stood the test of time. He's just ordered his book and he's listening to our stories now. So his question was, have his methodology stood the test of time as it related to the rise of short dated options? And there's a couple of other questions he's got here, but I'll stop there and see what you, and he's thought too, was there any adjustments you'd think O'Neill would make today if, if he updated that book? Thanks for your question. That's a good Jake question. Comments. First of all, everyone has spoken so beautifully about Bill. I've really enjoyed everyone's comments and everyone who has spoken and this their stories are right on about just who he was and his humility and just his kind of ability to give. He was just one of the most unselfish people I can imagine because he was just about helping people. You know, it really wasn't about the money and he made a lot of money, but it wasn't about the money. With regard to that question, so yes, it has stood the test of time for sure. I mean, the, the great leaders, you know, kind of maintain these characteristics and looking for really, really, you know, we're looking for the greatest companies in the market. And, you know, over the longer term, stock price typically is going to follow the earnings. And so, again, focus on that and cancel and, you know, who really has the edge and who's really changing the world. I'd say if there's one component that is where it's a little more difficult now is that the technical aspect, you know, is now very well known. You know, when Bill kind of outlined the different chart patterns, you know, the cup with handle and the flat base and the sending base and so forth, it was really a new thing to buy a stock at new highs. Like, no, it was really kind of counterintuitive. People thought, well, 
I want to buy a stock when it looks cheap, you know, after it's gone down. Buying a stock that's breaking out to new highs was like, wow, you know, who, who would do that? Now it's quite common, you know, for people to know where the pivot point is, to know when a stock breaks out of a, you know, a base or some type of consolidation. And so this is a lot more people following the system and following technicals today. I mean, I have a CFA. Yeah, I got my CFA back in the mid 90s. And there was not a single chapter on technical analysis, except the one chapter that outlined how it didn't work. So now, you know, technical analysis is quite common. So I think there's today more false breakouts. There's more shakeouts. This thing is a little more difficult in terms of in terms of the technicals because you know what what is obvious typically doesn't work and or at least not immediately. And so I think that's one thing that you have to keep kind of keep in mind and and so as far as you know how to adjust for that, you know, you just have to be very disciplined. You know, part of the system is not to buy stocks that are extended in price. You know, really having the discipline to, you know, if you miss a stock, then you miss a stock and you wait for an appropriate time to buy. Charles, one of the questions that came in was for those traders who are new to O'Neill, the the question is really, what is the, why go down the O'Neill rabbit hole? Like, why should new traders do that? And I think Brian spoke to that already a little bit, but how would you respond to a new trader who's like, oh, O'Neill? Well, this looks like a lot of reading ahead, a lot to learn. What would be the value of it? What's your perspective on that? So, you know, I remember when I used to teach the workshops and, and when I've been to workshops, this to, you know, you know, Bill would speak at the master's program. So, you know, sometimes you'd always get someone in the audience who would ask, like, you know, I only have, you know, 10 minutes a day, you know, what do I really need to know? Like, what's the main thing I need to pay attention to in order to make money? And Bill would say, well, you know, if you want to learn piano and you spend 10 minutes a day, are you ever going to get any good at playing piano? And, you know, we know the answer is no. So if you want to take this seriously, you have to put in some time. There is a lot of work and you have to really love it. You have to enjoy it. It's not for everybody. You know, if the market isn't really your passion, you probably won't be successful because it takes some time to screen and manage your positions and monitor and do the research necessary in order to build conviction. So you have to really enjoy it and love it if you're going to, I think, be good at it. At the same time, though, you don't need to be stuck in front of your screen all day long. You know, once you identify some leaders and build a portfolio, you can let them work until they don't work anymore. You know, I think there's almost an advantage to not being stuck in front of a screen all day long. As to, you know, why should someone maybe consider following this approach? It's time tested. You know, we, it's based on history. It's based on what's actually worked and it has continued to work through the decades. And so You know, there's a defined set of parameters. You know, you can kind of be, you know, it's something that you can follow. As one of the speakers said, it's something that makes sense. And so, and again, it's comprehensive. It takes into account the, you know, the general market conditions, the fundamentals and the technicals. And oftentimes, you know, what these great leaders are right in front of our faces. So whether it's, you know, Home Depot, when Home Depot came out or Walmart, or Apple or Tesla. I mean, I remember, you know, people I think know that I'm a pretty big fan of Tesla and I have a large position that I've held now for a few years. And, you know, I used to just on my way home, count Teslas on the way home. And, you know, a few years ago, maybe I count six Teslas or eight Teslas. And now maybe I count 30. So, I mean, oftentimes these things can happen right in front of our face. And so if you're kind of oriented toward that, it's really a wonderful approach to the market. And there is room for some individuality in there. I mean, I, I can't remember who was speaking. Maybe it was Brian, who I think has more of a technical approach now. I mean, you do, I think it, it is, not everyone can be Bill and Neil. Everyone you know, comes to the workshops, like, I want to be just like Bill. Well, you know what? Bill, Bill was Bill. You know, no one has Bill's DNA. Not everyone has the fortitude to hold a, you know, 
a gigantic position through pullbacks or through stress and have the discipline to act and cut a loss if necessary if things aren't working out it's not for you know not everyone has that ability so you know you have to i think you can use the system but also know your personality and what you know what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are like for me i'm a little bit more of a singles hitter i trade more actively than bill woods i'm trading kind of in and out around a core position whereas bill i think was was able to hold longer through a move so you know there are many ways to make money in the market you can uh, and Kansen is a great way to make money and again you can make some adjustments to you know attune it to your own personality thank you charles so so much mm -hmm. for that very fortunately mike webster has changed his mind and is going to be able to be part of this conversation you know he has to just listen so i was honoring that i was getting a lot of Excellent. dms from people saying why are you letting mike in the room and i was trying to respect his request to just listen but mike i just would love for you to share you know just what it's like for you to have been mentored by him and have had him have such an impact on you and you know what is it that you would like to share with everybody in this room some they're very new to bill o'neill some have known him for their whole career what do you feel it's like the most important thing that perhaps we haven't spoken to about him well first hey chuck it's not nice to hear your voice and um, hey, likewise mike good to have you on yeah, and I missed the beginning, so I'm not sure what was said. And yeah, I didn't want to hop on because it's been kind of a hard week processing this. But for people who are new to trading, what I'd suggest, and I've always suggested this, is, you know, read the book, then reread it. I've really found that doing the audio books, that helps me with things. And so I, you know, I was re-listening to Bill's book, you know, as I do often, and I've read it. I can't tell you how many times I've read it, just like Chuck. And, you know, anyone at the firm is just, you know, you have to know it inside and out, but it, it takes a while. It's, it's a very simple book, consider it a Bible, really, of trading. But at first, it, w it really seemed like he was contradicting himself in a lot of different places. But until you really trade and, you know, kind of experience the different things, you don't realize how much wisdom is in the book and how he wasn't contradicting himself. And he was really having just all these little nuances that just might be a, you know, a uh, little something that he dropped in a sentence here or there. And, you know, it can save you save your ass or you know it could make you a lot of money if you pay attention to it and i'm just so grateful for the time i got with him and for anyone who got any time with him even if it was just seeing him at a seminar and listening to him speak i mean i remember when chuck and i would come back from you know a workshop you know we did a lot of workshops just the two of us but when we do the masters it was you know, every, pretty much everyone at the firm and then bill would speak and we come back just so motivated, you know, because he just had that, no matter if you were just getting killed in the market and just doing everything wrong. And, you know, there are times where you just can't trade. Well, I can't speak for others, but there are times where I just can't trade my way out of a paper bag. And then you hear him and it just is, it's like, oh, you just want to go, you know, you just want to go and research and study and, you know, catch that next big one. And, you know, I'm a little bit more the way Brian is as far as, you know, not always trying to make it for the the way Bill did it, where he, he, he tried to hold for, you know, pick and save and price company were both held for years. And then he kind of morphed over over the decades and was shorter term, but shorter term relative to the way he used to be. So it's really important, and, I, and Chuck was saying this, to really do it your way and, you know, take his book, read it, reread it, listen to it. And when you first start off, you know, just trade with a little bit of money. Don't trade with, you know, your full amount that you want to trade with. Just trade with five or 10% of it until you learn lessons. And then 
especially when you really think you're great and you've got it all figured out, that's about the time danger's at your door and there's going to be some problems for you. So wait until you recover from that before you start trading with the rest of the, the, the money that you had planned on. But try to make it your own. Don't be afraid to adjust for your style. So that is a long-winded way of saying really nothing, I think, but I was just trying to not cry. So, Well, uh, I have yeah. to say, I think Thanks. the tears that all of those who knew him and respected him have cried actually make I know for me, it makes me even more fascinated to know and research this man because the people that make us cry when we when they pass on are the people that have touched us profoundly. And in a world where everything is so kind of, you know, flashy and fast and, you know, just like doctored up with neon lights, there's very few people that can move this many men to tears on the different platforms I've watched you all speak on. It, it's a testament to how authentic he is and how authentic you are. I mean, this is a loss as a human being, never mind as a contributing member of traders and investors. So I think it's I'm so glad that you guys are also emotionally moved to tears because it means that he actually was somebody who, you know, really changed your life, not just with the business side of what he taught you, but the life side. And that's my other question, Mike, is would you just share, because, you know, I care about mindset so much as a coach and I care so much about, you know, the concept of our lives in addition to trading, right outside of trading, what is one of the life lessons that, you know, Bill taught you? Wow. He taught me and anyone around him so much. And I think, God, that's a really good question. And it would be hard to narrow it down to one thing. But there's that quote that everyone always says is, you know, he's never met a successful pessimist. And that's just, you know, something I try. I tend to be a little bit of a worry wart or anyone who knows me, a big worry wart. And that wasn't him, you know. And and I remember when, you know, I was sharing an office with him and it was in 2001. And I just found out that I was, we'd been going through infertility stuff for a long time and finally got pregnant. And I got the phone phone call at work, which never happened. And, you know, I stepped out, Bill was in the office and I stepped out and found out not only were we expecting kids, we were expecting more than one. And this is, you know, anyone who traded back then, this was a fucking horrible bear market. I mean, 2000, 2002 was just not a good time. And so you know, I'm thinking, oh, man, I'm going to have twins. And we're in the midst of this bear market that I'm thinking is like 1929, which it turned out to be. And it was very stressful. And I come back into the office and I must have looked like I had seen a ghost. And he's like, you oh, know, Mike, what's wrong? And I said, you know, I wasn't going to tell anyone, you know, because you're not supposed to tell anyone for a while, but it's Bill. So I, you know, I told him. And, you know, he said, well, what's the problem? I'm like, well, it's a bear market and this and that and the other thing. He's like, wait. And then so he proceeds to tell me the entire story of when he started the firm back in 1962, 63, after he had made a bunch with Syntex, his first big play. And, you know, he tells me the entire story of, you know, how he was starting the company. And, you know, that's a big deal. And, you know, he's starting the company and he never worried. And then he started the newspaper and he told me how he never worried. And then he went through all these different huge things. And he's like, I guess I should have worried. But he's like, what would that do? And so, <laughs> yeah, you know, so it, it was just one of those things that afterwards I was like, wow, well, I'm still worried, but I'll put it a little bit different. So. Uh, in a nutshell, he was just, he didn't have a huge ego at all. Probably should have had a bigger ego given every, everything that he accomplished, but he just didn't really worry and he didn't have to because he was smart enough to never let anything really get out of control for himself. And, and, and so, yeah, I guess, sorry, I tend to be long winded, but it was it's him powerful, just being, being very Beautiful. positive. So yeah, thank beautiful. You. It's yeah, please thank you and thanks for coming in. You know, I have a lot of DMs from people like 
why are you not letting Mike come in the room? <laughs> so just thank you for coming in, even though the grief is so deep. And I hope you just give yourself, everybody who was touched by him as much time as they need to, you know, grieve. It's a huge loss because it sounds like this is not just a man who taught everybody how to trade and invest better, but also how to live better. Eve and Kathy, I'd love to just bring that question over to you guys too about the life lessons that you both, you know, walked away with him. And I know you speak about it in your book, The Life Cycle Trade, but I'd love you guys to both share here if you're willing to. Sure. I think what Mike mentioned, just the optimism. Bill was always very optimistic. And even during bad market environments, when I would talk to him, he would make me feel as though, you know, there's going to be an opportunity. We'll get through this. And so just helping get through those difficult times to always think about staying positive, staying optimistic. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And I meant to say before that we are over time. So any of the speakers, if you guys have other obligations, I don't want to be rude with, you know, your commitment to this, but I'm just, you know, think there's so many people in the room and there's so much hunger for information about him. So hopefully you guys can stay, but if anybody can't, please just feel free to, to, you know, just come up if you have to. Eve, thank you for sharing that. Kathy, is there a life lesson for you that O'Neill really, you know, passed on? Yeah, for me, when he signed my book, and I think he used to sign this on a lot of people's book, he just said, keep at it. And when I would talk to him in person, you know, I was, as I mentioned earlier, I was lucky enough to attend many seminars and be able to talk with him. And it's just, yeah, the inspiration of just that you can do it. And even, you know, I was one of those people that was working full time. And I think someone said this earlier, you know, you can set alerts and you can still make it happen, even if you're not doing it full time and you're having to do a full time job. And so he really was just being able to listen to him and understand that. And actually, I think Mike Charles said this earlier. Anyway, I was willing to do the work. And as he would say, if you're willing to do the work, you know, you could do it. And as long as you just keep at it, you know, you'll get there. And he was right. And for me, you know, it probably took two, three, four. And still, I'm still learning. <laughs> you know, I still listen to his recordings over and over so that I can get it down packed with that, you know, quote I shared earlier. But just, yeah, perseverance and never giving up. Mm, beautiful. And I just want to say that I have amazing podcasts with so many of our speakers today, Kathy and Charles and Brian Shannon, who just left. And Shane Dorian has been, was part of all of those conversations because of his help with being a Tanslim trader. Charles, I'm curious what a life lesson is that you learned from William O'Neill, if you're willing to share. I agree with Mike. It, there's probably a lot there's a lot to think about there. One, it's great to hear Mike. I haven't talked to Mike in a while. Mike and I, you know, one thing about Bill was, I think I mentioned, he, he wasn't really concerned with your pedigree or where you went to school or, you know, what, you know, what you kind of accomplished academically or, you know, how your resume was. He really cared about your results. And, you know, Mike and I both started in the research department of William O'Neill, and it was our trading of our own personal accounts, like, got us on his radar and that's how we became portfolio managers so you know he was willing pretty much to give almost anyone a chance if they had kind of a track record you know following the system and being successful at it so you know it was really an amazing opportunity that really he gave us a completely changed our lives and like i you couldn't really even like write a story about that it's just it's so unique that he would give someone the opportunity to change their lives and trust them with his money. This is quite amazing. I remember, you know, when Mike and I were sharing an office with Bill, particularly it was during that terrible bear market that followed the internet bubble. And we would, you know, we were kind of moping, you know, was we were complaining, well, we can't make any money. We're just losing money. Nothing's working out. And again, he was this. Bill would say, what do you guys think? The market just goes up every day? Is that all, you know, is that all you think? He goes, 
you know, this is like a long term thing. And, you know, it's a marathon. And, you know, you're going to go through tough periods. And it's not always going to be easy. But, you know, kind of hang in there. Thankfully, the CANSIM approach, the O'Neill methodology, uses an analysis of the market, you know, as part of a you know major component, one of the three legs of that three-legged stool. And so you can kind of wait out and wait for the market to improve and wait for a follow-through day before you get back involved. So really the beauty of the system is it will allow you to make a lot of money in a great market and prevent you from losing a lot of money in a really bad market. Mike, so it, it's, Mike, do you remember that conversation that Charles is talking about? Oh, yeah. Chuck will remember that he would say, he would always say, well, bear markets are are great because you, what, did, what exactly did he say, Chuck? It was something like, they're great because then you're going to learn everything not to do. Yeah. I mean, he, he was very, in a way, he was also like, in a sense, like kind of very forgiving in a way, like, you know, the market is going to teach us lessons and most of us aren't going to learn it on the first go. I mean, I'm still learning the lessons over and over, but he was like, you know, just pay attention and get better. And, you know, I remember sometimes we complain about, you know, how things were and he would say, you know, I was, you know, driving to work today and there was, you know, a homeless person on the street, you know, so what are you complaining about? So, you know, which was a pretty good point. Yeah. We always have a tendency to think about, you know, people who are doing better than us. And he was like, no, you've got it pretty good, you guys. So um, yeah, he was just an amazing do, guy. Do that, Chuck. He would always say that, you know, he just saw someone, you know, pushing a cart on, you know, on Lincoln Boulevard or he'd say, you know, this is more during like the war time, you know, at least you weren't born in Iraq or Iran. And he just had a way of looking at it from, you know, how fortunate you were just to be an American and to be, you know, he was so patriotic. Uh, and I think that's why he kept the newspaper afloat for as long as he did, because he, he wanted to help people make money, but he also had a big political message. I won't get into that, but he was, it, through his eyes, he was really just trying to, and I agreed with it, but he was just trying to help Americans, you know, whether it was through the through making money or through from the political side of things and just trying to inform people. And he was really selfless in that way of, you know, because Charles and I wouldn't have had success in the market if it wasn't for him, I don't think. You know, reading his book, he laid it all out there. I mean, you have to be an idiot to to not take advantage of someone just giving away all of their secrets for like 10 bucks or whatever the book costs. It's amazing just the consistency, again, with all of your diverse approaches, you know, with his learnings and teachings, how there's just this consistent sense of his temperament and approach and outlook on life, which is pretty impressive, I have to say, because I don't hear a lot of people in the trading and investing space rave the way all of you have raved and have for many years. So it's a pretty incredible legacy to leave behind. Kathy, we're just probably going to close up in a few minutes and Charles and Eve thank you so much for being here Shane is here too I think he might only be able to be listening but I just wanted to just ask you guys what would be your final words on you know what you want to say to those who are followers of him and to those perhaps who are learning about him you know maybe not for the first time but perhaps in a deeper way for the first time Kathy I'll ask you to speak first if you're in a position to you know, I've thought about that a lot. And Eve and I have talked about this. You know, I don't know what it's like for people that don't know who he is. You know, I don't know. I don't know what it would be like for me to be here, you know, how it would have gone without him. So it's hard to think about that. But I know yeah. when I do interviews, I always try to make sure I mention him always. And then, you know, it's funny. They'll say, well, let's make sure everyone knows who William O'Neill is because he's been retri retired. You know, he was retired for many years. Excuse me, but, you know, I just do my best to make sure I give everyone knows who I learned from and to 
just encourage them like he encouraged us. And so I'm just going to have to leave it there. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Kathy, so, so much. Eve, what are your, you know, final thoughts or what you want to close with about him? I just want to say thank you, Bill. He's a, he was a master teacher, and we gave him a plaque years back that said, a master teacher's influence ripples through eternity. And you know, thank you, Bill, for sharing your knowledge. And I, just as I listen to everyone talk about Bill and all of the connections that we've made here, it's just so true. And one of the things that he always said is, you know, ne- never give up. And he had such a very strong work ethic. So trading is not easy. But even when he was very successful already, he still worked very hard. So the work ethic is very important. And staying humble. And then giving back to others, sharing our knowledge with others so that we can help others as well. Beautiful. Thanks for Thank you me so on, Kim. Oh, thank you, Eve, and thanks for all your help with little behind-the-scenes matters. I really can't thank you enough for all of that. Charles, what are your last thoughts? And please yeah. be sure to follow our speakers here, everyone. And they just have so many books. And again, Charles, you have that extraordinary talk. So please be sure to follow them all. Thank you, Charles, thanks. for being here. Thanks. thanks for that, Kim. Yeah, you know, I think the... What Bill would want everyone to know, if he could speak now, is that anybody can do it. You don't have to be a genius. You don't have to be even very intelligent to be a super success in the stock market if you're following the rules and if you're disciplined and you work hard at it and you stick with it. And when I say, you know, be successful, I mean, you can change your entire life by learning how to invest and trade in the stock market. You know, I can speak for myself. I think I could probably speak for, I know the speakers, you know, today, and at least most of them. And none of us started with a fortune. You know, we started with pretty a meager portfolio to begin with. And and certainly for Mike and I, I mean, we started with a few thousand dollars and really kind of built that into a fortune. And so everything I have in my life, you know, material wise, I've made in the stock market. And again, you don't have to start with a ton of money. It's just amazing what you can achieve if you learn these, if you learn the system and, you know, use the tools and apply them properly and remain disciplined. It's just amazing what you can achieve. So I think that would be his message is, you know, be willing to stick with it, be willing to put in, some, you know, the time required and be optimistic and really believe. If It's really important to really have a, a belief in yourself, a confidence that you can change your life in the market and really shoot for the stars. You know, it's most investment books, you know, you pick up and read, they'll say if you can match the market, you're doing better than, you know, 95% of traders, which is true you know it's hard to beat the market but if you pick the right stocks and you know pick just a few winners you don't need a hundred winners through a lifetime you just need a handful and if you can identify a true leader and manage that position properly and maybe just get a couple of those in a row you literally will make a fortune and you can change your entire life So I think that, you know, I think I'll end it with that. I think that's what his message would be. It's beautiful. Mike, any last words that you'd be open to sharing just about why our listeners in this space, who we've had over 100 this whole time, need to walk away with about Bill O'Neill and his teachings? Well, well, I think that was perfectly said what Chuck and Kathy and what Eve had said earlier, you know, I think the one thing that people should take from Bill is that he worked his ass off. I mean, that guy had there. I know Chuck works really hard and I work really hard. And, you know, I'm kind of downplaying how hard the two of us have worked over the years, but no one touches Bill. Like he, he was just 
it was nonstop all the time. And, and that was decades and decades and decades of just doing that when he didn't have to. And a lot of it was he was just trying to find new secrets to give away really, whether it was through IBD or through the institutional side of, of the firm or, or you know, in his books. And, and just, you know, he was always doing a new edition of the book and putting anything in there that he had discovered or the firm had, you know, discovered with his guidance, that giving back. So I, I think what he would want to pass on to others is, you know, find your edge, work really hard at it, and then share it with people, which is not what happens on Wall Street. As anyone in the business knows, is you know, you find an edge and you just keep it dear and you don't share it with anybody. And that's not him. I mean, he wanted even more than sharing it with the institutional side, he wanted to share it with the average person who was, you know, picking up the newspaper every day back when it was, you know, printed and everything. And so you know, work your ass off and share it with others. You know, there's karma is a real thing, I think. And we all miss him greatly. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Charles. I'm going to have actually Shane close us out because I really feel I have Shane to thank because he is the one who really made me stop and start to pay attention to William O'Neill in the first place a few years ago. And before I let Shane speak, I just want to say that what I'm walking away with myself is just how his optimism and his constant encouragement of those around him, his work ethic, and how much gratitude he seemed to practice and constantly wanting to give back was a part of his legacy. And gosh, you're lucky if you have one or two of those in a lifetime and that this man had all of them just makes me even more impressed with who he was and how he rolled. So Shane, just again, thank you for being here. Thank you for introducing me to Kathy and Eve's book and then Charles, of course. So please Shane, share what you know what you want to just say about William O'Neill as we close up this space, if you're willing to. Yeah, so thank you so much for having me again, Kim. I really do appreciate it so much. I'm looking at my phone and seeing who's in the space right now, and I honestly can't believe it. Like I said, Charles Harris was one of my presenters at my master's course, and so was Mike Webster. And just seeing all these names is really special to me. And I think the biggest thing for me when I think back on Bill O'Neill is, you know, I heard him say many times that this system that he created wasn't his system. This is, these are, this is the market system. This is what happens in the market. It wasn't his opinion. These are facts. And it's really neat how he shared so much of his education and his work with everybody. And I think you guys are a great example of kind of continuing in that way through your websites and your books and all the seminars you guys have done, incredible works you guys have all done. And it's funny, I still, to this day, it's so neat to see Bill's legacy live on through you guys. I think you guys do a wonderful job at keeping his legacy alive and always will. He's had a huge impact on me. In fact, I'm sitting here in El Salvador on a surf trip and I'm staring at my Market Smith program on my laptop and I always visualize Bill sitting next to me. I always think if he, if Bill was sitting next to me, looking at my computer with me, analyzing this stock with me, would he be buying this stock or would he be shaking his head? And it's really fun <laughs> to think of that when I think of Bill. Wow, that's just so beautiful, so beautiful. Just thank you, Shane. Thank you for being here, making the time. Even though you're in another country right now, I'm very grateful you're here. Eve, thank you too. Thank you, Kathy and Charles. Mike, I appreciate you coming on, even though you really just wanted to listen, but the demand for your input was just too great. And just thank you, everybody, for listening. I will release this on my podcast, The Wall Street Coach, in another couple of weeks. Be sure to listen. I did some great interviews with Shane, actually, of Charles Harris, of Kathy Donnelly, and of Brian Shannon, and Eve. I think that just means you're going to have to come on and have Shane and I interview you too, if you're willing. Just grateful to you, Mike, as well, for coming into the conversation today. 
please make sure to follow all of our speakers. And I hope we'll see you guys back on another Twitter space in the future. It was a pleasure to host this today. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Be well and aloha. This has been the Wall Street Coach Podcast with Kim Ann Curtin. You can find out more about her and her team online at thewallstreetcoach.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please consider leaving a five-star review on iTunes. Thank you for listening.